creates questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. The Extraordinary is the recurring bad dream of this young boy. A frightening nightmare that should have passed from his mind long ago. The man came in and started shooting around a coffee shop. And I was lucky, like, I stayed behind the counter. There was all these people dying around me. And when that happened, I woke up at that moment. But Matthew Stichter will never forget the night he watched people die in the Strathfield Massacre, six weeks before it happened. It is the curse that befell eight white men who desecrated the holy ground of Arizona's peaceful, non-violent, and religious Hopi Indian tribe. I had always been healthy, always. And then, all of a sudden, all at one time, my liver, gallbladder, and my kidney shut down. The extraordinary is the day John Forsyth came to realize that some things in life have a power far beyond what seems apparent. It's something that, from that day to this, I will never forget. It is the restless spirit of a long-departed relative who refuses to rest. The extraordinary is the day Reg Jones walked into the Australian bush and captured on film an image that cannot be explained. When I got the photo developed and printed and looked at it, there's a great big monster looking thing sitting on a log behind them. That's this. I couldn't believe it. This is human. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight on The Extraordinary. The Bago Monster, not your average monster story. Good evening, I'm Warwick Moss. There are events in our normal daily lives that stun, make us sit up and take notice, realize that it could have been me. Sometimes it's a fleeting feeling, lost in the flood of mixed emotion. Then there's the case of 11-year-old Matthew Stichter, his experience didn't happen in the daylight hours. He saw something in his dream that terrified him. So much so, he ran from his warm bed to his parents' room to escape the nightmare. But what Matthew and his parents didn't know was that there was no escape. One night, Late in June 1991, 11-year-old Matthew Stichter's sleep is troubled, his mind in turmoil. It's a dream, a nightmare, that was to become horrible reality. He's in a shopping plaza, in a coffee shop, and through the mist, he's confronted by a man, a gunman. And when I hid behind the counter, the man came in and started shooting around the coffee shop. And I was lucky, like, I stayed behind the counter. There was all these people dying around me. And when that happened, I woke up at that moment. And I, I, I can't remember if I died or anything. I just woke up at that moment. Not surprisingly, Matthew was disturbed by the dream. And he sought comfort from his parents. It's Matthew. I could tell he was quite frightened and uh, there was something in his voice and his manner, so I just, uh, still half asleep, said, it's all right, come into bed with us, and um, I pulled the covers back, and he crawled into bed between his mother and I, and uh, I just said, uh, what's the matter? And he said, uh, I've had a bad dream. I dreamt we were in the coffee shop, and a man started shooting, and um, started shooting everybody, and I just stroked his face and just said, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it. 
It's only a dream, and he was shaking and shivering. And his mother started uh, stroking his face and speaking to him in Polish. Bad dreams, nightmares, terrifying visions that haunt youngsters in the dark of night. Dreams that are normally long forgotten when daybreak comes. And that would have been the case at the Stictors if it all hadn't happened again. Two weeks later, the same dream, the same plaza, the same coffee shop, and the same tragic results. It was very realistic, yeah. Like, like, when the man actually came and started shooting, it felt like, you know, he was about to shoot me, and, like, the bullets just, like, moved past me, in a way. And when I went to the coffee shop, like, it was like people were actually eating, and, like, they were in the dream, but, like, I could actually see him and feel him and touch him, at this, like, if I walked up to him. And perhaps there's a reason for this sharp clarity in the 11-year-old's dream. There was a coffee shop and a shopping plaza that played an important part in his family's life. Sydney's Strathfield Plaza. You see, Matthew's father, Otto, has a hobby. He creates photographic montages for his friends. And most Saturdays, he and Matthew used to take these artworks to have them copied inside Strathfield Plaza. We'd leave the photocopying at the photocopying place then pop across to the coffee shop which was only just up the uh, aisle and pick up the photocopying on the way back when we went back to the car so at that stage we, that was the only coffee shop we ever went to so if he said the coffee shop that would be that coffee shop just like if my wife and I said we'd meet at the coffee shop it would only be that coffee shop because there's no other coffee shop we did go to In 10 minutes of madness that stunned the nation, seven innocent lives were cut short by a lone gunman. 33-year-old Wade Frankham began his rampage in the coffee shop at Strathfield Plaza. That terror was tragically close to Matthew's dream. There's no doubt of that. He described that to me before it happened. He used the words, the coffee shop. I can remember that clearly. I can also remember him saying that the man started shooting and killing everybody. So I've got no doubt of that whatsoever. I recall that quite clearly. What, uh, what importance you place on that, how you see that, is whether it's a psychic experience or not, is something that I'm not qualified to answer. But I do know that he had that dream, that he mentioned it to me, that he had it again later, and that when he heard about the massacre, that the first thing he said was, it's just like my dream. So I don't... Uh, Maybe it is coincidental, but then again, maybe it's not. But there was, in fact, a definite coincidence. A very fortunate one indeed. On Saturday, August the 17th, the day of the massacre, Otto and Matthew should have been at Strathfield Plaza, as usual. But by chance, they were 20 kilometres away at the Sydney Opera House. Relatives from Poland were visiting, and the Stichters had managed to get tickets for a Mozart concert, the one and only matinee performance, and the only time the family had even considered going to the opera in the daytime. This massacre which happened started in the coffee shop, where Matthew and I would have been sitting, having a cup of coffee, having a sandwich, and uh, it's just a bit frightening in that to think that you might have been there in different circumstances. Like whenever people say something about it, like that, like it was like very, like a coincidence that we went to the matinee to like it sure like bring shivers down my spine in a way. Like it could have happened to, to my, my dad and I, if we were there. That afternoon, while they were enthralled by the drama on stage, Wade Frankham was playing out his own violent role in real life. Spelled H-O-P-I, it's an American Indian word. It means peace. 
and across the starkly beautiful desert expanse of northern Arizona, the Hopi Indian tribe has lived in peace for generations. They are deeply religious, silent, non-violent, and they honour their sacred idols above all else. But not long ago, eight white men desecrated their holy ground, and eight men paid the price. They fell to the curse of the Teo Leo Tum Sea. The plaintive cries of the sacred Teletumsi idols are carried across the Hopi lands by the wind. Only the Hopi Indians hear their call. It is 15 years now since they were taken from a sacred place by two white men, an act that destroyed a thousand-year-old religion and stopped an entire generation of young Hopi braves from reaching manhood. It was one petty crime of theft and measly greed, yet its repercussions are felt in the hearts and souls of the 9,000 surviving Hopi Indians who exist here in ancient villages of the high jutting plateaus that rise from the North Arizona desert. Felt too by the white men who knew not what they did. They have paid a terrible price, death, paralysis, and sickness. The eerie saga of the Talatumsi curse began under a late afternoon sun in July of 1978. Jimmy Lee Hinton, a lanky ranch hand and archaeology student, was 21. He and a friend had taken just another weekend to illegally rake through the local sacred Indian grounds to make a fast buck. Hopi relics like pottery are easy to sell to black market art galleries. The sun was going down and I had had this strange urge of a pool. I was pulled to walk off to the left of the trail. And there was a cleft, a small cave. The cave was walled up. And at the, at the top of the wall, some rocks had fallen. And uh, the sunset was shining right in. And there they were. And two of the, the idols, the doll figures, were uh, looking right back at me. The discovery Hinton had made was far more profound than he knew. Looking back at him from the bed of feathers were the most sacred of the sacred idols of the Hopi, the Talatumsi dolls. On the left, Dawn Woman. In the center, Corn Maiden's husband. And on the right, Corn Maiden. Lying with them in the cave was a fourth idol, Corn Maiden's daughter, which has never been photographed. There was something about it. It was an aura. There was power that was just coming out of the, out of that small opening. Not only did these idols draw me to them, but also because of the, uh, the aura they were emitting, also only let me get so close. There was something that just scared me to get any closer to them. And uh, I decided to go back to find my friend where he was at, Randy Morris. Under cover of darkness, Hinton and his friend Randy Morris returned to the cave with small flashlights, and they stole a thousand years of history. Stuff is ancient. Like a bunch of deer, we went off in the darkness back up to the motel. As we spread them out up on the bed, we had realized that we only had three of the idols that we had left the what turned out to be the baby of the group the family of idols we had left the baby alongside the road back up there back in the land of the hopis discovery of the theft was catastrophic to the hopis the idols were living entities the foundation of their spiritual world no young brave could pass into manhood without going through the secret rite of Estotokia, 
and the four ancient dolls were essential to that ceremony. The arrival of the Spanish who stole their gold and tried to stamp out their religion in 1540 was not as devastating to the Hopi tribe. The trappers and missionaries and settlers of the 1820s had not crushed their civilization as cruelly as this simple act of theft. Yet through all the centuries, as they would now in the modern world, the Hopis held firm to their peaceful, nonviolent beliefs. In 1978, no one outside the tribe knew of the Talatumsi. They were secret idols never to be revealed. The Hopis remained silent for seven months, simply praying, waiting. For as long as the idols had been sacred, so also they had carried a curse for anyone who removed them. In the course of finding black market buyers, they enlisted the help of friends and contacts. In all, a total of eight men dirtied their hands in seeking profit from the Teletumsi dolls. A signal of what would happen to each of them was first felt by Hinton himself. It was probably two weeks when uh, the curse started affecting me and Randy Morris. I can remember clearly as if it was yesterday when at two o'clock in the morning, I was awoken with one of the worst nightmares I'd ever had in my life. And it had to do with uh, being stuck repeatedly by a Hopi with an arrow. And the spirit deities of the Hopis in the background were dancing, elevated off the ground. The dream was so vivid I could still hear the bells and the tom-toms out in my front yard. The telephone rang. Just right at that time, as I was listening for bells, my phone rings. Randy Morris was on the phone, and he was hysterical, almost to the point of crying, and uh, almost basically word for word, description for description, of the dreams that I just had. In September, more than a year after the theft of the Talatumsi, the location of Corn Maiden's daughter, the idol left behind under a bush, was discovered. But as the years passed, the other three Talatumsi remained missing. And one by one, all eight men involved in their illegal journey began to fall. I had always been healthy, always. And then, all of a sudden, all at one time, my liver, my gallbladder, and my kidneys shut down. I knew that it, that it was this curse that caused it. And I was deathly scared. Hinton's health problems worsened. He would turn to drugs and spend three terms in jail between 1981 and 1988. Only after an apology to the tribal elders has his life become more normal. Randall Morris was paralyzed in a motorcycle accident shortly after the theft. Morris's father, who helped hide the dolls, seriously injured in a car crash on an Indian reservation. Stanley Jean Olson, 33, who tried to sell the dolls to galleries, killed in a traffic accident in 1992. Witnesses say he was chanting an Indian death song when he died. Don Stevenson, 69, who helped find bias for Hinton and Morris, suffered a heart attack and his wife developed cancer. Arthur Neblett, son-in-law of Stevenson, who found a buyer for the Idols in 1979, killed when his car drove off a road in July of 1983 at age 40. Mark Adler, the man who provided the truck that transported the Hopi idols, stricken with diabetes and symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Interestingly, the only man who has so far suffered no effects of the Teletumsi curse is the man who admits he eventually bought the dolls for $1,600. His name is Eugene Jinx Pyle, aged 44. Pyle insists now he chopped the dolls into pieces and burned them in a wood stove in 1981 because he thought the FBI was on to him. He too has personally apologized to the Hopis, but only the tribal elders know for sure why he has been spared. There are some who believe he's being saved because he alone knows the true whereabouts of the idols. 
No member of the Hopi tribe believes Pyle burned them. They accepted his apology, but they have their own evidence that the Talatumsi still exist. In that belief, a momentous decision was made by the elders of the Hopi tribe some months back. The old priest, driven by the fear that if the manhood ceremony called us Totokia was not conducted soon, the knowledge of it would be lost forever. The key priest was already 95, and in secret, 63 men, a generation, some by now in their 30s, were given the sacred rite with the last remaining idol daughter of Corn Maiden. The Hopi religion today remains at risk in the souls of its 9,000 people. They pray that the daughter of Corn Maiden is enough to please the gods in the ceremony. But they are happier now, for they hear the voices of the three missing Teletumsi in the winds that cross the plateaus. They believe Dawn Woman, Corn Maiden's husband, and Corn Maiden was somewhere out there, still. The day Reg Jones walked into the Australian bush and returned with the picture of what has become known as the Bago Monster. I, I just think queer to me why this thing would be sitting behind my two mates, great big monster looking thing sitting on this log. It is the serenity and peace that came to Hollywood star John Forsyth in the most unusual way. It heightened my appreciation, it heightened my, my love, it heightened my affection for people and for the remarkable things that surround us and the restless spirit of a long-departed loved one who simply refuses to let go of the material world. Oh, my God, he's dead. As the years pass, few things cling to our memories as strongly as the unexplained, the strange, the bizarre. Reg Jones is now 83. But back in 1932, Reg was a logger working the Australian bush. He had few days of leisure, happy just to have a job in the heart of the Great Depression. On one of his days off, Reg went for a walk with two mates. The only place to go was into the bush. And on this day, they took their trusty box brownie camera. What was captured on film remains a mystery. Reg Jones has been a keen amateur photographer for 60 of his 80 or so years. These days, you can still find him and his camera wandering through the bushland near his home on the New South Wales Central Coast. But there's one photograph in his collection that really stands out. Even though it was taken back in 1932 with his very first camera, a box brownie, that cost the princely sum of 19 and sixpence. It's a photo that still baffles him. Look closely and perhaps you'll see why. This ghostly figure in the background. The snap is one of a series Reg Jones took while he was working at an isolated loggers camp near Batlow in the Snowy Mountains during the Great Depression. Even with the Depression days, there was a lot of young fellas that didn't want to leave the city. Not only that, they couldn't put up with the, <coughs> the rough and the bad conditions that were up there. Of course, there was no uh, electricity or no gas or no water laid on or nothing up there. It was very, very primitive. Very few people would go up there, so I think that I was one that was picked and they said, well, right, I want to they more or less stood over us too, that if you don't go, well, you don't have a job. And in my case, I had nothing to lose and nothing much to gain. I had no family to go to. And so I thought, well, okay, the best thing to do was to take this job. 
Life up there in the mountains was lonely for a city kid like Reg. But some of his mates were old hands in that part of the world. And they were only too willing to pass on their knowledge, especially at night, around the campfire. They were telling us about uh, a monster or something that they'd seen in the forest, whether it was a ghost, or they didn't know. But they, they were, these are the sort of stories they told us, and queer noises, funny noises they could hear through the forest. And because I thought, well, that might only be animals. But they said, no, it wasn't animals. They knew all the animals' noises. And they said it was something definitely, you know, out of the ordinary. So anyhow, uh, uh, another story was about a, a chap that uh, had fallen over the falls down there, the falls that we'd been down to have a look at. They said that there was a chap fell over there and they could hear queer noises around there at times. Chilling yarns. But to brash young Reg Jones, they were too tall to be true. That was until one night, just a few weeks after he arrived at the Batlow camp. I was in my hut, went to bed and fell asleep, I was sound asleep, and all of a sudden I felt something shaking my shoulder. I woke up and I thought, what's this? And I looked up and there's this great big dingo standing alongside of my bed. And I thought, gee, what have we got to do here? <laughs> so I sat up, and as soon as I sat up, the dingo took off. Now, that was a story there that I couldn't understand who it was that shook my shoulder and woke me up, so I thought there might be something to these fellas' stories. Nevertheless, Reg was still eager to explore this rugged country and capture it on film. One particular day, he and two mates set out on their most ambitious expedition. We followed a creek down and uh, we got into the widening part of the creek where it widened out and the log had fallen across there. And then behind that widened part of the creek was the Budong Falls. We could hear the water going over the over the cliff and uh, I said to my mates, I said, sit on the log over there and I'll take your photo. The box brownies sure worked overtime and by the end of the day, Reg had a full roll of happy snaps. One of those frames though would eventually suggest that he and his mates were not alone in the bush that afternoon. When I got the photo developed and printed and looked at it, there's a great big monster looking thing sitting on a log behind them. And I thought, what's this? I couldn't believe it. This is not human. Sixty years later, Red still doesn't know who or what intruded on that tranquil scene. All he can make out is a ghostly figure towering over his mates. Something that looks like a man sitting with his hands in his lap. But then, occasionally, Reg's mind wanders back to those nights by the campfire and those yarns about ghosts and demons in the Batlow bush. I remember the stories that they were telling me about a fella that had fallen over the falls and lost his life. And I thought, well, it couldn't be. I might be his ghost. I didn't believe in ghosts. But still, it, it just seemed queer to me why this thing would be sitting behind my two mates, great big monster-looking thing sitting on this log. And I said, this is, this is, you know, out of the ordinary. Couldn't believe, just believe it. He's one of the best known soap stars in the world. Silver haired, gentlemanly, and always groomed to perfection. But there is a lot more to John Forsyth than a simple screen facade. In Dynasty, the handsome tycoon Blake Carrington was caught between the goodness of wife Crystal and his evil ex-wife, Alexis. Of course, Carrington is no longer my family name. In real life, he's John Forsyth, a star on the Hollywood TV scene for 30 years. 
We caught up with him in Beverly Hills the other day and threw out the usual questions about life, death, the hereafter, and the paranormal. Try reincarnation. No. Heaven and hell. I don't believe uh, in organized religion. The soul? I think that deep within us is some kind of energy that we call soul. And I'm not sure that I will ever believe anything other than that. And there is something within Mr. Forsyth that he believes he's learned about this life. The wonder of life, the, the beauty that, that surrounds us, that is ever present, if we can just look, the, um, the joy of, uh, of contact with each other, just those kinds of things. His appreciation for the wonders of nature around him followed a brush with death way back. Well, I had a very serious operation, so much so that uh, it was life-threatening. And I, um, I spent about a month recuperating. And it was the most extraordinary month because the first things that I saw sitting out in my garden where I used to sit and read were hummingbirds. Now, back east, there are no hummingbirds. They are the most extraordinary little animals. They, you know, the, the, the incredible velocity they have when they, when they flutter. So what I did was I set up a couple of, of uh, areas in which they could drink and watch them. And that, I think, was responsible in many, many ways for a whole change in attitude in my life. And I think in many, many ways responsible for, reco for my quick and speedy and total recovery. And it's something that f from that day to this, I will never forget. And every time I see a hummingbird, it's like seeing an old friend. How are you a different person now than before you had that brush with death? I think I'm much much softer. Uh, I'm, I'm more giving. I'm more giving to uh, not only to my family and to my children and grandchildren, but, but giving to people and to friends and to acquaintances as well. I think when you get uh, that, that close to a life-threatening situation that your values change. It would have been nice if I had been able to done it, to have done that before the operation, but having the operation, I think, heightened everything. It heightened my appreciation, it heightened my, my love, and heightened my affection for people and for the remarkable things that surround us that we're part of and really rarely get to appreciate as we should. I think there's a beginning and a middle and an end to all things in life. And death is just, just one of those factors. It's the final factor. But I don't think that it is as uh, compelling and, and overwhelming. It's just the end of a, of a period. Now, I remember everybody that I ever knew that is no longer alive. I remember them for their good things. I remember them for the not so good things. And I think people will feel that way about me when I go. I tell you, I haven't had a bad time. I've been here in, on this planet for, for a long, long time. And uh, it's been good. I don't have too many complaints. Whether fate has, has brought that about, or not, or whether it's something that uh, is engendered by me or by the people I'm around, but life is pretty doggone good. Now, the story of a family with an unwanted guest. In fact, a ghostly guest. 
a grandfather who refuses to go away. The family is not scared of him, but friends of the family certainly are. Just an average house in an average suburb. Well, that's the way it looks from the outside. Hello. Hello. But Jennifer Mills Coppin is convinced it's haunted. And so is her mother, Jean. When Jennifer was three years old, she lost her father to a tragic illness. And a few months later, her grandfather died. But Jennifer and her family hadn't seen or heard the last of Popper. She and her mother still talk about the night a year after the old man's death, the night they moved Popper's favorite chair into their bedroom. I woke up in the early hours of the morning, wide awake, and I looked over in the corner, and my grandfather was sitting there. Mum, there's Poppy in the chair. When I sort of opened my eyes wider, I could see that it was a man dressed in a um, double-breasted suit and a hat. Uh, I couldn't see his face. It was too, that was very dark. I kept looking and eventually it faded. It seemed to fade. It, it sort of was very ob obvious for a while and then it faded. It seemed to like as if disappear. This late night encounter was disturbing enough, but soon that grandfather's restless spirit or some other entity began to make its presence felt in more disruptive ways. My family was sitting down to dinner at the dinner table with a, a number of guests. And as we were sort of talking and eating, our cuckoo clock jumped off the wall. And I used the word jump advisedly because it didn't fall. It used to jump. But Papa wasn't through yet. There was the day Jean was getting ready to do the ironing. She glanced out the window and swears she saw an old man out digging in the garden. Nothing strange about that, except... Oh, my God, he's dead. That old man was Jean's father, Popper. This woman was so insistent. I watched him for half an hour as I was doing the washing. I said, no, there was nobody there, but if you show me where he dug, I'll tell you who he is. And they said, well, he was digging over there. And they said, oh, there's no soil dug. When she saw that there was nothing, no soil turned and nothing dug up, um, she sort of went home and they moved three months later. Fred is an old friend of the Mills Coppin family, but that friendship was stretched a bit when they started telling him their ghost stories. And by then, they had even more witnesses, including a couple of boyfriends who'd been scared off by things that went bump in the night. Fred, though, maintained his healthy skepticism until... I'd been working in the garden, and when I finished, I wanted to go and have a shower, so I went into the bedroom, left the door open. I became aware of some like, movement out of the corner of my eyes. I looked around. There was a, a finger drawing the door closed. I saw the door closing. Nobody did it. So that sort of opened my mind. Clocks flying off walls, ghosts digging in the garden, spirits shutting doors. Interesting stuff. But what happened next is even more interesting. It raises the intriguing possibility that what humans do in this world can influence activities in some other realm. I had a really bad argument with my mother. I stormed out to the backyard and went down to the back garden and was throwing dirt at the fence, convinced that the world was against me. The tantrum was short-lived and life in the Mills Coppin household returned to normal. Well, for a few hours anyway. that have happened in this house. The, the night that the dirt was hitting the windows was the most frightening. You could look down the yard and you could see the dirt coming, but there was nobody there. Is that noise? I hate that noise. The 
and I don't know to this day what it was. And I can't come to terms with that. And I never will until somebody explains it to me. The Mills Coppin family, at least three or four boyfriends, half a dozen dinner guests, and a few friends of the family, they all witness ghostly goings on here in this ordinary suburban home. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Natural story has gripped American publishing and scientific circles so much since the Amityville horror incident. This one happened in California. A ghost story with photographs and videotape that defy explanation. What's wrong? What happened? I told you, get down, get down! Something had grabbed him and put a rope around his neck and hung him on a rafter in an attic. Something around my neck. More on the ghost of San Pedro next week. That's it for tonight. Don't forget, we'll have more from George Anderson, the remarkable man who seems to have a direct line to the hereafter. George will have another amazing case study next Thursday night. Before we go, a look at another upcoming story. It's about a mother who had the most terrible premonition of all. She foresaw a family tragedy, a vision that she says helped her in the most unusual way. Good night. See you in the future. You're Donna Brown's mum. The dream was a, a warning to steal me from the shock that I was going to experience and the reality of what the dream actually meant. You're Donna Brown's mum.